So I'd like to begin with, uh, begin with a question, and it really is a genuine question. Can we really talk about humanity vitae and related questions? Are people really open to arguments and evidence on humanity vitae <clears throat> and related questions? How open are we to being deeply uncomfortable? What the focolare call uniting with Jesus forsaken? With the set of questions this document and its legacy raise. I must admit, though I work very hard to foster dialogue, being somewhat skeptical about this, I fear the views all of us have may be simply too entrenched, and that we are currently in a culture which prizes personal comfort and safety above genuine exchange across difference. Power, not evidence and argument, seems to be the name of the game more generally and with regard to discussions of humanae vitae in particular. And everyone on this panel, in one way or another, has been affected by power related to humanae vitae and its reception. And there is, of course, the power of the institutional church in this regard, cutting off debate, and especially some decades ago, punishing those with heretical or heterodox views. But without downplaying the very real and hurtful consequences this has had for a significant number of people, people I'm proud to call friends, I believe that the major thrust of how power works now is clearly in a very different direction. When even the Pope says, basically, let's stop talking about contraception, you know we're not in Kansas anymore. For most academic theologians, being criticized by the right in this regard is a boost to one's career, not a burden. Indeed, in some contexts, one is suspicious if one is getting too easy a pass from the institutional church or the far right with regards to some of these questions. I hope you don't mind my sharing some of my own experience in this regard. I strongly suspect that my being criticized by the Cardinal Newman Society for bringing Peter Singer to a Catholic campus didn't hurt my chances of getting tenure at Fordham. It likely marked me as safe with those who held power over my career. Can't be too bad, right, if the Cardinal Newman Society is after you. Indeed, I'm not sure, given the power structures as they currently exist, I'd be, given, I'd be giving these remarks if I didn't have the protection of tenure. But even outside of academia, which kind of can be a strange place, let's admit it, in the broader culture, I think we should also say that the consensus in power lies with the view that humana vitae, if people even know what that is, is somewhere between deeply problematic and morally reprehensible. In my work with the pro-life movement, I've seen, for instance, the tactic, the tactic used by pro-choice activists time and time again to push pro-lifers to say, you're really against contraception, aren't you? Really, that's what this is about. The implication being, of course, that if someone were to admit that, they'd be hopelessly morally contaminated that no one could take them seriously. Oh, those crazy pro-lifers, they really don't care about babies, they care about controlling women's lives. That, I mean, look, they even, most of them, or many of them, uh, are against contraception. All right-thinking people in this regard simply understand that artificial contraception is perhaps the greatest emancipatory tool ever, especially if one is a feminist. Wouldn't anyone with a different view simply be a misogynist? So given this, why would I even accept an invitation to discuss humanity today? Well, the first reason is I have great respect for our panelists and moderator. I'm very excited to be exchanging with them. Um, I'm actually really looking forward to our discussion after dinner, at dinner after this. But I'm, um, I'm here because I think Humana Vitae and its legacy came, or what became its legacy, was related to the fact that it came out at the worst possible time for it to be heard, in my view, in the view of a lot of other people. Perhaps today it can be heard with different ears, especially after 50 years of data to support, reject, or complexify its claims. We have a new cultural and ecclesial moment, uh, and perhaps that is reason for hope. Again, um, given uh, Professor Lysot's remarks loom large here, Humanae Vitae is a new document in the church. None of us will live long enough to understand its legacy. But like a good academic, that won't stop me from speculating. So 
onto evidence and arguments about humane vitae proper. Given our topic this afternoon, I wanted to make four different kinds of claims. First, what it means to be pro-life is complex and cannot be a single issue discourse. Abortion on the basis of the numbers of people killed and the level of their vulnerability, I think is the most important pro-life issue, but it is certainly not the only pro-life issue. I think Pope Francis's influence on the consistent ethic of life is very important, especially given his focus on hospitality and welcome as an antidote to the throwaway culture. Hospitality and welcome, I think, play critical roles in how to think about the main argument of humana vitae. Second, the fact that Pope Paul VI is also the author of Populorum Progressio is good reason for us to imagine humana vitae in a different way. Perhaps as David McCarthy argued in his contribution to a very important book that Professor Lysot argued called On Moral Medicine, which is so big it's kind of a weapon, but you should still buy it anyway. Uh, it's, uh, my students kind of look at me strange when they come in the first day with a big book, but then they, then they don't regret it. I don't think they saw it right now. Um, that Humanae Vitae is best thought of as a social encyclical. Traditionally, that's not how we've thought about the distinction between Humanae Vitae and Populorum Progressio. But I agree with David McCarthy that it's a better way to think about it. Third, Pope Paul VI predicted better than he knew in Humanae Vitae and was likely guided by the Holy Spirit. The Catholic Church thinks in terms of centuries, as we already talked about, um, so we don't, of course, know the legacy of Humanae Vitae and won't know, but I would argue that the early returns look promising. We don't want to romanticize or sugarcoat the past, of course, but the separation of sex from procreation, though having some short-term gains, looks to be a long-term social disaster. The relationship, and finally number four, the relationship between contraception and abortion is by no means clear, and therefore it isn't clear that contraception is anything like a central part of the solution to our almost one million abortions every year in this country. Indeed, the kind of sexual culture that contraception has brought us might create at least the perceived need for abortion in at least several ways. So in the time I have remaining, which I've used almost half of already, I won't be able to do anything um, like make arguments for these four um, uh, principles or ideas or arguments, but um, let me just try to briefly go through some of what uh, may help substantiate them and maybe we could talk more together as a panel or in discussion um, together. So what has the separation of sex from procreation meant for our sexual culture? In trying to answer this question, our colleague in moral theology, Carrie Shane Davis Zimmerman, argued through her research on the hookup culture that you wouldn't even have the hookup culture if it weren't for contraception. And especially in our Me Too moment, the relationship between the hookup culture and a culture of sexual violence needs, I think, our deepest attention. Detached from its proper ends, sex just becomes another product in the marketplace, with consent and power being the primary ways the goods get distributed. The numbers of people who are addicted to porn and the ways that this has had on our, uh, the impact this has had on our uh, sexual violent, cult, sexually violent culture are simply astonishing. The problem is so bad that even liberal countries like the United Kingdom and Iceland have literally tried to ban porn. And if you, uh, if you think this is bad, just wait until sex robots becomes normative. That's why I'm really looking forward to uh, Rebecca's book. By the way, somebody needs to get her a book contract for that, so let's, <laughs> let's get that done. One might think that the a sexual culture of contraception and safe sex would produce less sexually, fewer sexually transmitted infections but the opposite, of course, has been the case. There is some evidence to show, in particular, that um, contraception leads to people having riskier sexual encounters. In New York City, where I work, more than one in four have a sexually transmitted infection. The paradoxal, um, so the freeing of sexual culture from limits that was promised and delivered by contraception, to say the least, has major problems, and I would argue has gone uh, poorly. The paradoxical result, though, has been, especially in the Me Too era, a return for many people to be open to very serious rules. 
even apps are now being created where you have to like hit a button on your phone for every level of consent in a sexual encounter. We don't quite know what the rules are yet, but the rules in many cases are already here and they're coming, so get ready. We're going back to rules. The, now, let me move on to, uh, maybe we should cut. I'm not gonna have enough time. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's talk about this. What effect did the separation of sex and procreation have on reproduction? And in, in trying to answer this question, or at least gesture at it, um, maybe we'd ask, what's in a name? Why, would, why, why do we use the word reproduction as opposed to procreation? Well, it's interesting that the word product or production is right there in the word, right? Um, much like sex becoming a, a tool of the market, procreation has now become a tool of the market as well, unsurprisingly, if we think about it as reproduction. The market decides when and if we should have children, what's uh, kind of income and lifestyle is, nece is uh, necessary for that. And what this means is that childbearing now is often pushed until much later in life, when it is much more dangerous for both mother and child. IVF is becoming normative, especially in this uh, regard, and use, um, especially in the context of our throwaway culture, the discarding of embryos, often for ableist and other discriminatory reasons, has become uniform. Also, the market has decided what price uh, certain women can get for their eggs when they sell them on the market, and even their uteruses. <clears throat> market forces demand higher prices for eggs from suitable women, for instance. If you have a high SAT score, you're a varsity athlete, or you're just very attractive. Along with shopping around for the cheapest gestational car carrier, or, um, carriers. India just banned, for instance, international um, uh, attempts to uh, buy uh, um, uh, their women as gestational car uh, carriers for obvious reasons. And this has led to this kind of uh, market-driven um, uh, process has led to a fertility crisis. We talk about overpopulation uh, quite a bit. We rarely talk about the fertility crisis in Europe, Russia, Japan, and even the United States. Uh, even Pope Francis has criticized this, uh, as he's called it, the grain of Europe. He talks about the cultural energy kind of waning. waning. You may know you need at least 2.1 children per woman in order to replace a given population. Austria is 1.4, Belgium 1.7, Croatia 1.4, Czech Republic 1.5, Denmark 1.6, France 2, Germany 1.4, Great Britain 1.8, Greece 1.3, Italy 1.3, Netherlands 1.7, Spain 1.3, Sweden 1.8. These countries have tried lots of things to get their fertility rates up. There's been huge economic and other and social welfare problems as a result of this. They've tried tax incentives. Um, France in particular has done a good job of this. That's one reason why they're at two. The problem is so bad in Russia, how, however, they've kicked it up a notch by creating something called Conception Day. Have you heard about this? Nine months before the national holiday, everybody gets a half day off of work to go home and have sex in the hopes they have a child that is born nine months from that day. Japan's fertility problems are so dramatic, they've lost trillions in G, uh, GDP and have a, had a population decline of one million people in the last five years. And since the culture generally, uh, generally resists the idea of immigrant labor, they've turned to robots and artificial intelligence to try to meet their labor needs. A disproportionate amount of Japan's elderly, for instance, are served by robots today. Lest we get on our high horse, this is happening in the United States as well. In 2008 and 2009, the US had a replacement rate fertility of over 2.1. If we continue on our current trend, we, uh, oh, since then we've fallen to um, 0.3 below replacement. And if we continue on our current trend, we may end up in a similar place to the countries I've mentioned earlier. Is it too extreme, and I'll, I'll leave it, well, no, I'll, I'll finish with something else, but I'll leave it at this point here. Is it too extreme to wonder what will stop us from sliding into a sexual and reproductive culture in which sex with robots becomes our primary sexual outlets? and IVF with genetic testing with ableist assumptions on market-tested embryos via PG, PGD 
becomes our primary reproductive outlet. If you've got a way to stop it, uh, I'd like to hear it. Um, and I think Humana Vitae might, or the principles within Humana Vitae might be part of the solution. Let me, um, let me finish with this. What do Catholics owe Humana Vitae? Can we admit that it has an authoritative claim on us? Saying that it does, of course, doesn't mean we have to accept it, whatever that means, or accept everything within it, again, whatever that means. But it does mean, I believe, we need to wrestle with it, try to put aside our confirmation bias, engage with those who think differently, and allow such uh, wrestling and hopefully transformative conversations allow us to be challenged and perhaps even transform our point of view and to be patient in doing so. Many have lamented our fellow Catholics' refusal to wrestle with Pope Francis's great encyclical Laudato Si. I know I'm one of them. But I'm not sure on what ground we can stand hoping for that if we're not willing to wrestle with humanity.